afternoon from the sunny and warm Copenhagen. Welcome to the webinar, Energy Mapping and Data Collection to Identify Long-Term Opportunities for District Energy System, hosted by the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. My name is Aris. I'm working as a program officer at the Copenhagen Center, and I will be the moderator for today's event. A couple of things before we move to the main content of our webinar. This webinar is going to be about 60 minutes long, including time for, uh, for questions at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end or you want to get back to our presentations, all the materials and the recordings of the whole webinar will be available online in a few days on the Copenhagen Center's Knowledge Management System. And we have many other webinars and information there. Have a look. I'll give more information in a few minutes. Now, uh, before we start discussing about today's topic, I would like to inform our attendees that we comply with the General Data Protection Act, also known as GDPR. This means that your personal data, such as name, email, workplace, uh, etc., is safely processed and stored, and all of your rights pursuant to the GDPR are respected. You have full access to the data being processed about you, and at any time, you can request that inaccurate data be deleted or rectified. For access or further information, please contact with the people that are presented here. A few things about the Copenhagen Center. The center conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. The center has an established network of global, regional, and national partners with a broad range of stakeholders to help accelerate the implementation of energy efficiency activities. On a regular basis, the Copenhagen is conducting webinars. All materials, including recordings and presentations from previous webinars, can be found on Copenhagen Center's Knowledge Management System under the e-learning section. The material of today's webinar will be uploaded shortly, but until then, you can check one of the previous recommended webinars that are related to today's topic. Now, I would like to briefly introduce the speakers of today's webinar. Clara is working as postdoctoral researcher at the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, and she specialized in the climate conscious transformation of the building sector. And Lucas is working as a senior scientist and team leader at the Energy Economics Group at Vienna University of Technology. He has more than 20 years experience in research on future perspective of sustainable energy systems with a focus on heating and cooling, energy mapping and planning, scenario development, and analysis of policy instruments. Finally, I would like to inform that you can send us your question during the presentations using the dedicate icon, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can at the end. Please do not forget to mention the name of the speaker that the question is for. And now I would like to give the floor to Clara. Thank you, Addis, and welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining as was uh, briefly introduced by my colleague Addis, my name is Clara Kamarasa and I will be guiding you through the first introductory session of this webinar. But before we delve into the content, I would like to share some context of the program this webinar has been forged in. The webinar today has been developed within the Global District Energy and Cities Initiative. This is a private public partnership co-hosted by the United Nations Environment Program and UNEP-DTU partnership, particularly the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency that was just presented, with the mission of helping cities tackle the energy transition through the use of district energy systems. The initiative supports local and national governments in the identification of pilot projects and the development of local and national strategies to accelerate the deployment of district energy systems. It currently has over 60 partners, including private sector, research institutes, development banks, and other public entities, actively working in over 30 cities across 14 countries all over the world. And what do we do exactly? Well, we focus on four main aspects. We increase the knowledge and awareness of multiple benefits of district energy through a number of capacity building activities. We provide technical assistance, identifying pilot projects, undertaking rapid assessment and pre-feasibility feasibility studies, selecting most suitable business models. We support also in the tender process and develop long-term local district energy strategies. 
And we also support scaling up efforts, mainly at two levels. At a local level, through the establishment of local multi-stakeholder coordination units, and at a national level by assisting in the development of national frameworks that support project development. Last but not least, we help to unlock investments by supporting the identification on financial me of financial mechanisms by aiding the project financial stability, mostly focusing on pioneer projects in each of the specific markets we're working on. I would also like to stress that this webinar is part of the training modules offered by the District Energy and Cities Initiative within the GF6, which soon will be available uh, in the Copenhagen Center on energy efficiency, C2E2 website. The content covers six key aspects of district energy development from fundamentals of distributed energy systems or district energy systems to business models, financing options, and procurement of sound sustainable projects. The content of today's webinar complements the information that can be found in module three of this training, which is again, energy mapping and data collection to identify long-term opportunities in district energy systems. Now let's delve into the content. Uh, and to this end, let's start by defining energy mapping. Energy mapping refers to the visual representation of energy and material flow distribution along the system related to its geographical location. Energy mapping processes basically tackle or, or identify local conditions such as sources of excess heat, renewable heat, or cool assets, as well as concentrations of heat and cooling demand. Energy maps, as um, will be presented in the examples from uh, Lucas later on, can contain, among other variables, data on existing and projected energy consumption from an understanding of the load profile in each case, present and future building density and type, sources of surplus of industrial heat supply, large energy consumers and buildings with potential of excess heating and cooling capacity, and linked to this, of course, potential anchor loads and their energy consumption. Energy maps can also provide an overview of the current and potential network routes. Now, why is energy mapping so important in the development of district energy systems? Energy mapping is crucial in the energy mapping or planning process as it helps to identify individual projects, properly expand and connect them in the future and link this expansion also with other infrastructure development uh, for shared trenching, for instance. It also allows networks to maximize waste heat recovery and target high energy density areas, leading to more cost-effective solid systems. Furthermore, it allows zones to be selected where the city can apply its land use authority and tailor specific incentives or initiatives to it. Energy mapping can also reveal physical barriers and opportunities linked to the location, such as local energy sources, distributions, transport even, land use, deployment of density, etc. It can also highlight potential savings to optimize the use of available resources with this. Now, from an energy system perspective in this way, energy mapping enhances the comprehension of locations, distances, and capacities to match heating and cooling demand and better calculate its distribution costs. Energy mapping, therefore, is crucial in the development of long-term strategies at a local and national level and identifying also potential pilot projects in the case that there's not an existing um, yeah, district energy in the place. It also shows the opportunities for interconnection of assistant networks as well as retrofit needs. As Lucas will explain later, from a supply and demand side, energy mapping can also contribute to the security of supply due to energy diversification, but also cost reduction, as well as help in the development of and, and also rehabilitation plans, identifying any anomaly or illogical data uh, from static to dynamic uh, needs, it, but also data supply, but also along with it, planning for the development and reconstruction of the pipelines in line with the changing energy needs. So it's also a very dynamic exercise in this case. From a process perspective, energy mapping offers an easy way to present otherwise very complex and abstract data to different audiences, keeping non-technical stakeholders on board um, and enabling stakeholder discussions and open debate. 
it becomes a very useful tool in stakeholder engagement and public awareness as it showcases the system potential and complexities through a universal language, which is visuals. Now, I just mentioned some of the overarching needs of energy mapping and also its potentials, but in district energy uh, development, when zooming in into the different district energy project types, there might be some more specific reasons to undertake energy mapping for each of the type of projects. In new district energy projects, for instance, where the market share of uh, this technology or this solution is low or even inexistent, energy mapping can be used to demonstrate the potential of district energy networks and um, also justify the costs associated with carrying out the project. It could also help identify startup networks or demonstrator uh, projects that it has been the, the case based on our experience, along to boost the confidence in the project and secure private sector investment. When it comes to um, district energy consolidation projects with high market share in distribution energy systems, energy mapping can maximize the identification and connection of waste heat sources and recognize the potential distributed renewable production and potential for integration of district cooling and, and, and district heating network, just to mention some. In refurbishment networks, energy mapping can help to identify potential interconnections and transmission lines, as I mentioned earlier, as well as to understand losses in the network. For instance, it can help to identify potential waste heat sources that could be connected into, into the system or network. And last but not least, in expansion networks, energy mapping can help to identify interconnection and pooling of networks, establish renewable energy sources of heat, and again, of course, help to attract uh, investment. Now, coming up to the types or level of granularity of the various energy mapping exercises, and again, it will be Lucas which, uh, who will showcase this in a much more uh, concrete uh, manner through the different examples. But also we have to, uh, this uh, energy mapping has to do with the different phases of the district energy system uh, project uh, it is embedded in, each of them with a specific set of data requirements. So for instance, in an initial phase, an initial mapping will be required to understand the overall city needs, framework conditions, and urban plans. The further we move into the process with the in-depth assessment, a mapping for detail and mapping for visibility will be required. Now, what do each of these three mappings mean? And let me please clarify before I do that, uh, these are just very broad classifications. Many more details would be needed to comprehensively uh, characterize each of them. The said initial mapping can be performed at a national, regional, and city level. The objective is to give direction where efforts need to be focused in, develop, in the development of the district energy systems. Resources such as time, funding, and data requirement to perform this initial mapping are the lowest uh, of the, these three type of mappings. Moving forward, we have the mapping for detail and mapping for feasibility. Both are carried out on a local and district scale, so, so basically zooming in uh, a little bit more. However, the requirement on time and data is higher um, in both of them, especially in the mapping for feasibility. Mapping for detail is typically carried out to justify the need for a pre-feasibility study, when mapping for feasibility is carried out to determine uh, whether the project is technically and economically sound. Hence, different types of energy mappings give different insights. Uh, they answer different questions. They also entail various levels of data requirements. The more you advance in the project and the type of energy mapping, the data and cost requirement might also increase, but in return, higher levels of uncertainty in the results um, and the assumption or, or yeah, and conclusions can be obtained. Whichever the case, it is important to use mapping strategically to achieve the right answers based on the project phase and needs. And of course, identify, again, as, as Lucas will, will show later on, the right indicators, the right parameters that need to be um, represented in each of the mapping exercises. And uh, on this note, I finalize my presentation. I thank you all for your attention and I leave the floor to Lucas Kranz 
uh, who will describe uh, many of the topics that I've uh, briefly mentioned in much more detail by describing a number of projects, cases based on their experience. Uh, I just wanted to say that for more information on the Global District Energy and Cities Initiative or the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency, uh, I've shared here the, the two links. And so please feel free to visit the websites and um, over to you, Lucas. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Clara, for this overview and for this invitation to share today some yeah, thoughts, ideas, results on energy mapping. Um, so you already raised quite a number of, of typical questions, policy questions in the context of district and urban energy planning. And I think it's quite clear, as you said, that this spatial dimension is, is very relevant, in particular for heating and cooling solutions. Uh, so mapping is needed. In my presentation, I want to uh, discuss the role of energy mapping in district energy planning, uh, discuss di different steps in the development of energy mapping, how to use heat maps also for strategy development, showing some um, cases uh, and and uh, also discuss some lessons learned and recommendations. The basis of my uh, presentation and of the, the slides that I will show later on are the following projects and activities. The first is uh, the Horizon 2020 project Hot Maps, which has been recently completed. The objective of Hot Maps was to develop, demonstrate, and disseminate a toolbox, the Hot Maps toolbox, to support public authorities in strategic heating and cooling planning. So try it out and uh, um, uh, under hotmaps.eu, um, how to use this open data, open source toolbox. A second project um, which I will show is uh, the project Spatial Energy Planning. It's an Austrian research project, still ongoing, uh, where the goal is uh, to, to develop and provide the basis for a rollout of spatial heat planning in Austria by the development of, of an heat atlas and heat app for municipalities and, and regional governments in Austria. And yeah, last but but not least, I also wanted to mention that with Article 14 of the Energy Efficiency Directive, um, actually every European member state is uh, obliged to carry out a so-called comprehensive assessment for efficient heating and cooling supply, um, also including mapping of um, heat demand and supply for the national territory. So we did that for. The, for, for the Austrian government. And I think it's also interesting to compare these different approaches among uh, countries. Uh, and I think it also provides a, a rich um, uh, data source, but the intention, of course, is different for Article 14 than for local heat planning activities. Um, I want to stress, as you said, Clara, before, mapping is a means, not an end in itself. So uh, we need mapping for different uh, purposes of spatial energy planning. And in a similar way, as uh, Clara, you mentioned before, I also think it's important to stress there are different intentions, different um, objectives of uh, spatial energy planning, starting from energy strategy development and also regular monitoring on a city level on a region level, maybe also even on a national level, then going down to the lo local planning and even more technical planning on project level. And of course, the required level of data granularity and mapping granularity increases or is different. Um, I would like to uh, mention a few examples from pilot areas that we um, um, uh, had as partners in the Hot Maps project, um, uh, starting with Kerry County Council. They are starting with a high share of oil, um, LPG, and electrical heating uh, currently. And uh, the main target, uh, main questions for them in the strategy process is uh, what is the role of individual renewable alternatives and what could also in this more rural context of this area, um, what could be the role of district heating? Um, 
Frankfurt already starts with a high share of district heating, but uh, which is still fired uh, or, or based strongly on coal-fired THP. Um, so the question is, how can this uh, supply structure of, of district heating be modified and how can also the existing excess heat potentials, in particular also from um, uh, from servers, from uh, data centers, be used to cover uh, uh, parts of the heat demand and what are feasible levels of heat savings. And the uh, third example is uh, the case of Bistrita in Romania. They had previously a district heating in the city, but it shut down and now the heating system is more or less completely done by individual gas boilers and so it's a huge challenge to to change this uh, system back to an to a renewable one or, or to not back but to a renewable one so again the questions were mainly what are feasible levels of heat savings what shares of district heating could be achieved in the city and which renewable energy sources are available um so i, I wanted to to uh, it, it uh, mention these start different starting points because it's it I, I think it becomes clear that the situation is very different in each of these conditions but in each of these conditions uh, also mapping is essential to uh, have a starting point of the analysis so we uh, started with a description of the city and analysis of the stakeholders we mapped the demand we had then a first stakeholder meeting set up scenarios against discussed it with stakeholders and formulated a strategy together with the public authorities in these cities so and the mapping although it's just one bullet point here is an essential part of the strategy process so that's the reason um why i also want to go in more detail on 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 uh, yeah what can be what could be what should be included in energy maps and heat maps and there are different dimensions probably more than i um sh i'm showing here on this slide we have the first as the first dimension which um elements should be used, uh, or, 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 or should be shown and probably all of them are relevant which are listed here we need the the demand of energy and due to the local nature of heating and cooling, I think heating and cooling demand is, has a high priority here. Data on the building stock in terms of floor area, number of buildings and so on is essential. And of course, also the supply resources, excess waste, uh, industrial excess heat, waste heat uh, and, and renewable energy sources. Then we have the dimension, the time dimension. Of course, we need the mapping for the status quo, but we also need the mapping for the future development. We want to use the maps for future for strategy development, which will um, have an impact in the future. So we also need to assess possible developments, in particular regarding energy demand in the future, um, to take into consideration these possible developments. Third dimension is the level of granularity, and uh, we have different options. We can we can have a more statistical based, high level um, uh, approach, which is cheaper, also more easy to obtain, or a bottom up approach uh, with a higher granularity on building level, uh, better validated data. And um, in the following slides, I will focus on the demand uh, uh, mapping because I think it's it's in particular challenging and 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 important, um, and on the different uh, uh, dimensions along this demand mapping. Demand mapping, heat mapping, can be done with different approaches. In the hot maps project, we developed a default heat density map on EU27 level based on a, I would say, high level statistical approach uh, using data which is available overall Europe. And of course, um, and I will show this afterwards, um, when uh, it, it, doing calculations on the local level, it's, it's interesting to see, okay, how, how valid are these 
high-level um, um, maps and do they need refinement with local building stock data and 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 how could this refinement look like but still um, if we do this refinement with locally available data it's a static approach and a more um, so if anything changes in the building stock it's still a, quite an effort to recalculate the demand mapping and and so on so in the spatial energy planning project that i mentioned before an automized uh, approach was uh, developed to integrate up to date data in particular also building stock data and other background data to generate uh, let's say on demand um, um uh, heat maps but again still um we cannot be so sure whether these uh, demand maps uh, or, or how well these demand maps um, match and fit with the actual consumption of buildings. So for this, we need basically um, data from utilities on building level or at least building block level. And we are doing such a validation process currently for the uh, city of Munich. Um, and and also within the spatial energy planning project, these validation activities are ongoing. I want to focus now a little bit on the um, EU27 hot maps default density map. Actually, it's EU27 plus UK. So what we did is that it's, it's a top-down approach. As I said, um, we are starting with national data on not zero level like population, building stock characteristics, number of buildings, number uh, of dwellings, net floor area of dwellings, and so on. Also, the, from the energy balance, the energy consumption per energy carrier. We break this down to NUTS 3 level by using statistical data, again, on popul uh, regarding population, building stock characteristic, value added per sector, heating degree days, and so on. And then we do the next step from NUTS 3 level to the hectare level, and uh, the question is, which type of data is available on hectare level? It's basically population, it's Korean land use data, it's European settlement data map, it's also uh, data from from uh, for, for gross domestical um, products, uh, Korean land use data again for for uh, and so on, and we derive from this the heated gross floor area for residential and non-residential buildings, and together with um, the, the average useful energy demand indicators derived basically by uh, yeah, heating and cooling degree, days, uh, share per construction period, so the, per the vin vintage class, and the surface to volume ratio, the heat density map showing heated cross floor area and useful energy demand on hectare level and so of course there are a lot of open questions and uncertainties also linked to this process and i want to highlight a few of them starting with the building volume the building height is is uh, turned out to be challenging to to uh to model uh, and how we did it was we we estimated a relationship between the average number of floors and the building footprint print and this is here shown for 150 randomly chosen municipalities across europe and um the red line is what we finally um applied in the model and we see that uh, we are underestimating and overestimating the number of floors in different cities uh, and under different uh, conditions in diff for different building footprints um, so this is already a, 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 a reason for uncertainties but in average it um, doesn't fit so, so bad we will see later uh, we also use open street map data, but it turns out that at least for some cities, like uh, for Athens, for example, as shown on the left hand side, the, uh, the yellow part, the, the open street map data doesn't cover the whole settlement area, uh, based on the European settlement map. Um, so we consider different sources and, 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 merge them, so to say, to get the best out of each of these data sources. I mentioned that the useful energy indicator is also based on the 
vintage class on the construction period and this is done based on the soil sealing data um, the global human settlement project provides soil sealing data for different periods so starting before 1975 then 75 to 1990 and so on and so uh, from this soil sealing data we get an estimation which um, share of buildings already existed before and afterwards uh, although of course we also here have some uncertainties because buildings might have been already demol demolished and newly constructed and so on but again it's an indication at least and the results you can see um, uh, and also download as open data from the hotmaps uh, platform uh, you can select any area within the EU 28 or 27 plus UK and uh, have a look at the at the heat density map and then also calculate total heat demand and the heat densities for a certain area but of course the question is now how well does it really fit it's a statistical top-down approach and we can expect it will not be perfect for each and every location in Europe so we uh, compared the data with customized heat density, heat demand layers, which we developed in particular for the three cases of Pistol de Frankfurt and San Sebastian, but then also for a number of other cities um, uh, across Europe. And for these three, at least for these three uh, um, cities, we received shape files of all buildings in the city uh, together with other data sources like type of the building, gross floor area, age. Um, in San Sebastian, for example, we had more detailed information for non-residential buildings and so on. Uh, we integrated this together and compared now this uh, new customized uh, data with the to top-down default um, um, heat demand data. And uh, this figure shows now the ratio of the default data to the to this reference source how we how we called it so this customized uh, source and um, of course there are also data uncertainties in this customized um, uh, data so we do not necessarily know how accurate these uh, customized uh, more individual data is but yeah, at least we have we have a comparison, a, a, a possibility for comparison for the indicators population, uh, gross floor area total, gross floor area residential, heat demand. And um, we see that for population, it fits quite well for most of the uh, cities, the deviation is below um, yeah, plus minus 10 percent for gross for gross flow area we have stronger deviations for some uh cities uh so um, up to yeah 30 even 40 percent but most uh, of the cities are again in this range of plus minus 10 percent and the same is true for the heat demand um, and now, of course, this has also an if, if, if effect on the um, uh, on the distribution of the demand. And here we uh, just show for the cases Bistritza and in Romania and Frankfurt in Germany um, how the difference between the bottom-up approach and the top-down approach um, looks like on a hectare level. And it's interesting to say, see that in Bistritze, the um, top-down approach um, overestimates gross flow area and heat demand in the city center, whereas in Frankfurt it's the other way around. Here we underestimate somehow the um, gross flow area in the and heat demand in the city center and at least for Frankfurt, it's quite clear the high-rise buildings are difficult to assess without having a European-level uh, digital surface model available, which we did not have for this purpose here. Um, so, conclusion so far, 
are uh, the default heat it maps and um, gross floor area values are uh, turned out to be very useful strate for strategic purposes on an aggregated level, in particular also for larger regions, municipalities, whole cities, and especially uh, it turns out to be very valuable in locations where no better data is available and also the resources are restricted to um, uh, to get better data and or to collect better data. And but on the other hand, of course, for a detailed planning of heating and cooling infrastructure, um, specific local data uh, should and need to be used. Now, coming from this refinement with local building stock data to the heat app and the heat atlas that has been developed um, or is currently in development in the spatial energy planning project. Um, so. Um, the basic idea is here to use in, as input data um, uh, a series of, of governmental GIS data, go open government data, also restricted uh, data from regional governments and municipalities, also information from the from the billing registry, from EPC databases, for heating system databases uh, where they exist, um, information on the location of the district heating grid as far as it is all available and also for the gas grid as far as it is available. Also uh, use digital surface models Models which are available in 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 all these uh, concerned um, uh, regions and municipalities, and um, this input data is used first in a in a module to identify the billing polygon and address, uh, which is of already the first challenge because uh, it turns out that the addresses are not always um, yeah directly link to a certain billing polygon, so this needs to be clarified. Then we need information on the billing usage. Is, is it a residential or non-residential billing? If non-residential, do we know about uh, something about the sector? Uh, do we know something about the envelope quality, uh, the geometry in particular, um, considering uh, the digital surface model, uh, the elevation model, uh, then the conditioning of the buildings. Uh, what about the existing HVAC system based on, on heating system databases and so on? And uh, finally, the specific energy needs um, as, as indicators for typical um, construction periods as well. And the results are then on building level, the polygon address, usage, and relative quality geometry, conditioning, heating, and cooling energy demand, which can look uh, like that for the for the case of, of uh, part of Vienna here. And, and the nice thing is that um, this can be regularly updated as soon as one of the input data uh, changes. And I think that's the big um, advantage of this more automatized approach which has been developed here in this project. And then, as I said before, we need validation based on consumption data on, on, uh, from utilities. Um, and that's, I think, one of, the, one of the most challenging parts. Uh, in particular, uh, what, what I can see from a recent project that we are doing now, or an ongoing project for, for um, uh, utility for Munich, for district heating company in Munich, is that, uh, yeah, they, they have very good data on, on for, for consumption, but uh, not so perfect data for the billing stock. And so there are considerable uncertainties regarding the, the height of the buildings and so on. And But uh, if, if we manage to get this, uh, this, for example, this height of buildings, right? Then we can also uh, be quite accurate with our demand projections and match match them with the consumption levels. Coming back to what I said before, mapping is a means, not an end in itself, and that's the reason why I also want to show how um, we in, in the in the hot maps project. Uh, Combine or, or build on the on the customized heat and floor area density maps, um, and also apply a, 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 a different other calculation modules. For example, a calculation module for the demand projection to develop future heat and floor area density maps up to 2050, and use these future heat density maps 
calculate potential uh, economic district heating potentials and also calculate um, how this district heating um, could be uh, supplied on an hourly basis, considering different load profiles and also supply profiles, compare then the cost of district heating with the decentral options and come up with an overall scenario assessment on regarding costs and emissions for the overall city. Um, and and uh, yeah, before coming to an end, uh, here an example how this looked like for the case of Frankfurt. Uh, here we developed, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, current and possible future heat maps with uh, 35, 46, and 53 percent of savings in the uh, uh, by the year 2050. Uh, we developed this uh, current and future heat density maps, and then. Uh, applied these heat density maps to calculate potential economic potentials of future district heating, where we can see here on this map the, in red the current uh, steam net operated by Minova, the, um, the Frankfurt district heating company, and in yellow the hot water uh, grid of Minova. And then we have two scenarios of district heating expansion, the green and the blue one, with uh, considering different uh, market shares and also different, um, let's say, acceptable uh, heat distribution costs. And then we said, okay, how could this supply both individually and and uh, for the district heating grid be supplied, and how does it compare in terms of costs? Um, so, summing up, coming to my conclusions. When doing energy mapping, there are key uncertainties. For high-level approaches, I see these key uncertainties in building hate. I expect that it, or hope that maybe not so far in the future we will have also uh, better uh, digital surface and uh, uh, digital elevation models available helping here, but currently I still see this as a challenge. All the number of floors in particular for large non-residential buildings. And then um, high, high challenge, the specific energy needs to be applied for different building types. We don't know usually the insulation level of buildings. Uh, we definitely don't know anything about user behavior, often even not about the usage and the mixed usage of buildings. And we don't know, or often we don't know um, sufficiently uh, valid on uh, so which HVAC system, so uh, how the conditioning of the systems of the buildings uh, work. In particular, also the age of the systems, the efficiencies, and so on. So we need to link existing data sources, for example, from chimney sweepers, utilities, um, different public authorities, EPC databases, building registries, heating system databases. And I think it will become also more and more relevant to ask for a mandatory data provision from certain actors to the public authorities. And I think also the cooperation of utilities and public authorities is important because each of them has specific information which the other does, does not have usually. Um, I see a certain trade-off between the required resources to set up the consistent building stock model and the related heat map on the one hand, and the uncertainties related with an available default heat density map on the other hand. Um, and the suitable approach depends on available data and the concrete policy aim questions and needs. On this slide, I put some sources. You can have a look on them later, I guess. And yeah, with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lucas, for the very detailed uh, presentation. Now uh, it's time for the Q&A session. So I would like from uh, our speakers to activate the web camera so the attendees will be able to see us and to see who are be be behind that event. Uh, we received several questions. And uh, Lucas, I'll start with you. The first question is, what is the minimum data that is required to conduct energy mapping? I mean, within EU27, I would say um, the minimum effort is go to hotmaps.eu and 
and use the heat density map available there. This is very low effort. And this is also the intention to provide uh, a first default data set for municipalities, for public authorities who do not have yeah, better data available or, or the resources for better data. Uh, but if, let's say all the outside Europe or, uh, or, or if you want to go a little bit in, in more detail, I think what is essential to have um, let's say the some information on the billing stock uh, data and on the billing stock uh, and this could be in form of of uh, shape files of the polygons and then information on the um, type of building usage of building vintage class of buildings and then of course also as a calibration local energy balances I would maybe add to that, uh, if I may, Lucas, uh, the different um, HVAC systems, maybe, of the, yeah, of the different buildings. Yeah. I guess it depends also whether you want to do the mapping for useful energy demand or final energy demand. Yeah, but of course, yeah, if the, the aim is also to go towards final energy demand, and then you will need to the HVAC systems as well. Which, to my experience, is very hard to get. And, and only, so not, not so many public authorities have access to it. Uh, thank you very much. The next question is uh, uh, one of the attendees is saying, thank you for sharing the hot map project. It is really interesting. And then he says, as I can see, there are a lot of comparison and studies on heating side. What about the cooling or combined heating and cooling? Can they have similar accuracy for mapping by following the same steps? Yeah, thanks a lot. So uh, indeed, we focused strongly on heating, but we also did some some studies on cooling, and we, in particular, we we developed a concept of how this could also be extended or or applied to district cooling um, estimations, um, potential estimations, and the key challenge. So in principle, yes, can be done, and and you can find also on hot maps cooling density maps, but. The challenge is that, um, in particular, on the on the on the spatial level, we don't know which part of this theoretical useful cooling energy demand is actually covered. Um, there, we know that, in particular, let's say Central Europe and Northern Europe, more or less the whole heat demand is covered, but cooling demand. Is usually not covered, and at least so, so a large part of the cooling demand are simply not covered. It's simply becoming hot inside the buildings, and so that's a key source of uncertainty in this context. I would say. Thank you very much for the response. Uh, the next question is uh, for you, Lucas. Uh, what is the number of person hours and total cost to prepare a heat map for a typical European city using your method? So again, if you if you are satisfied with the accuracy of the hot maps data of the hot maps heat density map, map the the costs are extremely low. Yeah, five minutes. Not exaggerating. Five minutes. Go to a, go to the website. Have type in the, your your city. But then of course things start. Yeah, because you may recognize that. In some areas or, or in some part of your city, you're not satisfied. And maybe with a, for, for a certain more strategic, um, um, question and, and, and policy case, it's still sufficient. But, but I expect that if you start, uh, thinking about in more, more detail about, yeah, what could be district heating, zoning and so on, then it starts to become a higher effort and um i can it, it's I, I cannot really give you an, an an answer to that because it's so it depends so much on this level of accuracy to which you want to go or even level of optimization you in in to which you want to go and yeah 
And data availability, I would say. And, and, so, thanks. And data availability, of course. So if you already have a lot of data available, for example, um, billing, so digital billing surface models, yeah, uh, usage of buildings and so on, it's so much easier. Uh, he, uh, when uh, the attendee want to clarify, uh, he's asking, what is your cost to prepare this? <laughs> No, I mean, yeah, we, we would be happy to discuss this in in in, in, in on a bilateral basis. It also it, it strongly depends on the size of the of the municipality and the, and the, but I mean, in the uh, just to give you an impression for the for I mean for for the hotmas pilot areas, it was a development process. Yeah, we developed the tool and in parallel did, did the strategy process. But we but we we, we used. Let's say, we would say several person months to to do this for the for each of the the, the pilot areas, um, which is of course which can of course be reduced um, uh, now that a larger part of the, of the methodology is established. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question, Roma, that I can see here, he says, if you could pick one indicator or data point that could be collected in a systematic manner globally uh, to support energy mapping, which one would it be? So, um, I mean, it's also the, the question of what, what I think would be feasible. Yeah? So, for example, um, I would find it extremely interesting and important to know more about installed heating systems, yeah? but I don't think that's that's somehow feasible yeah so i think already i think a high step forward would be and and maybe quite concretely achievable would be the the more relevant uh, so, so more accurate data on the geometries in particular building height on height yeah yeah I, I, I wanted to say, Lucas, that as it was phrased, or as I, it came across to me at least, it sounded like a wish list. Um, so <laughs> well, I think you can choose both in that case, um, the install systems and, and the height. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And then, of course, that, that's, I mean, also, also consumption. No? And but consumption uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's also a data privacy issue and, and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be on the wish list um, uh, part of it, right? Uh, if it would be, we don't have to take into consideration like uh, what's feasible, what's not, for sure the consumption and, and, and in a dynamic way, right? Uh, if, if possible. So, um, yeah, that would be also my, my take. Thank you very much. The next question, uh, I think, Lucas, is for you, Ian, because the attendee is mentioning the, the Frankfurt example. And the question says, for the scenarios 2050, did you take uh, climate change into account? Less heating needs, increased cooling needs? Yes, yes. So we, we considered climate change. Um, I, I mean, of course, um, what, what does it mean to consider climate change? There are so many uncertainties, but we, we applied one scenario, um, a standard reference scenario of um, Climate change and the change of heating degree days. In this specific case of Frankfurt, we did not consider cooling, but could of course also be done and should be done. And uh, we have another question, which it's a clarification question. Uh, the question says, which unit is NUTS zero and NUTS three? Ah, okay. This is nuts level. Um, nuts. It's the um, it's a way how, on the, in, at least in, in, in Europe, uh, different geographical levels are classified. So NUT0 is a national level, and then that's down to NUT2 and 3. It breaks down into smaller regions um, and, and smaller ge geographical units, which can represent, but no, do not always represent, also um, political um, areas and their boundaries. Thank you. The next question is about uh, Africa, and it goes: How can we uh, how how can we get a proper training for energy mapping and data collection? And also, how can we uh, uh, work together in Africa for projects? 
I would say the Global District Energy and Cities Initiative is a great framework for that. Um, of course, with uh, the expertise, you know, we have great experts uh, on board within within the initiative, including Lucas. So, I, if I may jump into that uh, question, Lucas, I would I would um, yeah say that's the the a great framework because we do operate on a global scale. We do um, have gathered up, I would say know how and uh, yeah lessons learned from different contexts, including. Um, the the African continent. So yeah, I would say that's. And as I mentioned at the beginning, also the um, we are uh, we have developed uh, a number of e trainings um, that soon will be available on the on the website. Um, they are mostly or chiefly tar targeted to to uh, public authorities uh, from a national uh, to a, a local level. And uh, yeah, the idea is to also follow that up with more tailored uh, uh, trainings uh, to in order to yeah adapt that content, that uh, information into a more specific con or context specific um, uh, framework condition. So yeah, maybe also thanks. I, I I don't want to claim that I'm the expert for each and every region in the world. So just because I did some work for Europe. So, uh, but I would find it extremely interesting also to, to um, exchange experiences, let's say, for different um, uh, climatic and, and cultural conditions. We, um, and, and just to mention, there are also webinars, um, our, 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 our e-learning um, material available on our website. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question, and we're coming close to the end of the webinar. Uh, the question is regarding calculate the amount of floors from building heights. Does modeling get better when building types or the construction age classification are taken into account? Uh, uh, yes, yes, uh, probably. I guess yes, probably it would be would become better. But still, it's also a matter of the specific difference of cities just to, to highlight this difference between Bistritz and Frankfurt I mean in Frankfurt we have these high-rise buildings in the city center and in Bistritz we don't simply have that even although we also have office buildings in Bistritz yeah but they are just not these high-rise office buildings as they are in Frankfurt so it's um here I think we really need to have better data on the on the local level or or on the or, or also just have better data on the on the on the building gate i i don't have a better suggestion or idea uh, and one more question i promise this is the last one but we received a lot of questions from the audience uh, the question is how can you assure that energy mapping is included in the planning processes of a city could you share some recommendations based on your experience? I mean, I just I just noticed that energy mapping becomes more and more, let's say, common, and uh, although is is seen more and more as a requirement of proper energy planning, and I also see that there are regions like Baden-Württemberg, for example, in Germany, who now in a mandatory way ask their municipalities to do energy planning and energy mapping and they also have developed a guideline how to do it so i have the feeling that it's becoming more and more at least in in parts of europe in europe um, more and more relevant um and more and more practice and i think it's also up to the to the to the regions and maybe uh, national governments to support this process and even make it mandatory so, thank you for the detailed responses to the questions, both of you. Uh, Clara, do you want to add something? No, I, I would just yeah subscribe what what Lucas mentioned. I think it's um yeah it, it's an increasing trend I would say, uh, and also related to the fact that we, there's more and more data available in many in many streams. So that of course um and and and. Uh, of course, the, the tendency of wanting more data-driven uh, decision uh, to be taken place on a yeah, city level or district level or even national level. So, yeah, I would basically agree with uh, what Lucas mentioned. I just wanted to say, Lucas, because I've seen there's been a lot of questions, um, just to highlight that uh, we will collect them, uh, the remaining questions, and, and attend them uh, uh, after the webinar, of course, because we, yeah, we don't have time at the moment to attend all of the different questions, but we will. Um, that's the intention. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, family, finally, we come to the end of the webinar. I would like to say thanks to the panelists for the informative and uh, very interesting presentations and to the audience for their active participation. We hope that the presentations uh, will be beneficial for all stakeholders involved in energy efficiency and uh, district energy. So thank you for your attention and I wish you a good day or good night from Copenhagen.